Okay, so last day of our single cell workshop, and uh, I just want to turn that on first. I want to just thank, uh, first off, all of the TAs who have dedicated a huge amount of time over the past two weeks to um, be here, help answer questions on Slack, uh, off, you know, up, get record and then trim and upload recordings. There's been a, a huge amount of, um, you know, Smith has been doing a ton of work, making sure that all the lecture content uh, is put together. Scott's been putting a ton of energy and making sure that the notebooks are uploaded properly. And I, I really think that this whole slew of TAs has been in and out of rooms, really just like putting in a, a bunch of extra effort. And I just wanna make sure I acknowledge and thank all of that. Um, because I think this workshop would not at all be successful unless we had such an engaged group of TAs. So um, thank you all for that. Uh, I um, want to start today by talking a little bit about something we mentioned yesterday, but I think is a fundamental part of neural networks that I think I just want to make sure is really clear because we're going to talk a lot today about the difference between training and running a network and sort of what different steps are doing different things. Um, none of this should be hopefully not totally new material, but just to reinforce it. So um, there are basically two ways that neural networks are used. There's a training phase or two phases, let's say, of using a neural network. There's training and then there is running the network. And so training basically involves, imagine when you're, you know, imagine like using a linear regression, right? You fit a line to your data. And then you can evaluate that line at different points. So training is fitting the line and then running or evaluating is just saying, okay, I've got a function, mx plus b, let's just plug in values of x and get new values of y. And so with neural networks, we call the first step training. The first step is there's all of these parameters, right? Some networks have millions, tens of millions of parameters. The first step is to randomly initialize all of the weights and biases. Does all of those terms just get random values? And people notice that you, you initialize a layer in PyTorch with random. This is just to give them random values. You don't want to set them all to zero because that's a very arbitrary configuration. It actually works well to have them have different weights. Um, the next thing that you do is you take a set of training data. So this is data that you have some confidence or you know, some set of labels in. Uh, in unsupervised learning case, we're actually gonna talk a little about some data where we're actually trying to do visualization using neural networks. The training data might be the same as the test data. You might be trying to run it on all of the data. But the important thing is that in training, the input data is split up into batches. You don't run the neural network across all of the data and then reset the weights. You run it, you split up your data first and then you run it on batches. The next thing that you do is you look at the output of the network, right? So you put data in, it runs all the way through the network, and then you get data out at the very end. And that value, you compare to some expected value. And the expected, the difference between the expected value and the output of the network is evaluated using a cost function. And Smith was talking a lot about gradient descent yesterday. The idea is that you try to evaluate your cost function you know, we'll be talking a little about autoencoders today, where the goal is just to recreate the out the input at the output, and then say, you know, how different is the output of the network from what's at the input of the network? And so reconstruction error would be your cost function. We then calculate the gradient. We then use a process called backpropagation to update the weights and biases in the network. And I'm also just all of these bolded terms, I think are things you could go and look up and you will find entire, uh, you know, swaths of blog posts and papers on each of these. And how do you pick training data? How, what are different cost functions? Well, how do you calculate gradients? What is backpropagation? These are all topics you can go and learn more about. But I'm trying to make sure I put them into one standard framework here. Once you have um, some set of training data and you, you know, evaluate in gradients, you evaluate this until you achieve convergence. Um, and sorry, I'm just going to mute you so that I can hear that the key coming through. Um, what you, until you get convergence where basically the error on your training data doesn't change over a different value. Some people notice, uh, some people notice that uh, there's some oscillations or fluctuations in the uh, in this convergence state, but basically there's a point where you realize you stop. Uh, then finally, you compare your results to some validation or test set to evaluate the performance of the network. 
And if you find that the network isn't doing very well, you then reconfigure the network hyperparameters, the number of nodes, the number of layers, the activation function, and then you repeat the whole set again. And the, the idea is that once you've done this on a validation set, then you take a totally unseen test set at the very final end, and this is how you actually evaluate it. Right. So if you think about alpha fold, which predicts protein, uh, protein structure from sequences, DeepMind had access to a whole bunch of labeled training data. We know protein sequences and their structure. I'm sure that they separated out some set of that, 10% or so, to be their validation set. But this is all in the public domain. But for the CASP challenge, there's actually an unseen test set that no one gets access to until the very end where you have to actually do the prediction on these new sequences. Um, and there's a, you, there actually is a phrase called privacy, um, which has a different meaning in neural network literature. We're trying to decrease leakage from the test set into the training of the model. Once you have a trained model on your data, you then evaluate the network. Training is incredibly slow and incre very inefficient. A lot of really exciting neural network papers run on, you know, arrays of graphics, you know, GPUs, graphics cards worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars over a period of weeks and weeks and weeks to actually train the network. But once the network is trained, you can download it off of the internet and run it on your computer very, very, very quickly. And so if anyone was paying attention to Apple's M1 chip release update, one of the things that they talked about was GPU acceleration neural networks on their CPU, or on their CPU, but this is actually just for running the network, not for training the network. Because running the network is actually the thing that most end users do. They want to classify an image. They don't want to train a network to classify an image. Um, and this is relatively straightforward. Uh, so that, you know, this is a whole bunch of phrases. I hope, you know, you can go and look up, look up if you want to learn more about or ask questions about. Um, we're going to start switching, getting into the content of today's lecture. Um, before we do, I just want to remind everyone, this is in an email this weekend, I'll post messages on the Slack announcements channel. Um, if you are interested in getting a certificate from this workshop, um, you, we, we are going to require you to fill out our end of course survey. I timed it, it should take you about five minutes to complete. There's about seven or eight questions, but a lot of them are just like, was the lecture too fast, yes or no? Um, and then there's a, we'll ask you for exactly how you would like your name uh, appearing on the certificate, because last year we had some people who registered with different names and what they would want on their certificate. And so we would like you, everyone to fill out this form. It's live now, you can fill it out. There's an underscore here that you can't see, but it's bit.ly slash yellml underscore jan2021. Um, and I'll send this, share this link many times. Uh, if you'd like a certificate, you have to fill out the survey. Okay, great. So with that, uh, I'm going to get started and talk a little bit about the first part of the lecture content today. Uh, and the main thing that we're going to be talking about are different forms of autoencoders, GANs, which is short for Generative Adversarial Network, Conditional GANs, which is a variant on top of GANs, Cycle GANs, which are another different variant on top of GANs, and how they all apply to single cell analysis. And one of the things that I hope you'll sort of see um, through today's lecture is that a lot of um, the creativity and novelty in neural networks comes from people taking this fundamental unit of the neuron and then assembling it in novel ways or regularizing or changing the way that we train a network in new and interesting ways to perform particular tasks. And that there's a bunch of derivative works. There's someone invents one idea, someone tweaks one part of that, another person tweaks another small part of it, someone tweaks another one. And I hope that you'll get the sense that training neural networks and designing neural networks is actually almost more of an engineering task than it is a, you know, sort of mathematical, we're going to think about first principles and then sort of define proofs and then use that to form algorithms. Neural networks are much more of let's build something that we think is going to do a particular task in a particular way. All right. So the autoencoder, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. The basic idea of an autoencoder is that you have some input. So here you imagine one node for every feature in the data set. So every gene or perhaps one of every of a hundred principal components. There are successive hidden layers. So this is the first hidden layer. Usually they're fully connected. There can be many hidden layers. You could have one, you could have 10. Um, they can have anything, you know, hidden layers anywhere from two to well, actually, two is usually in the bottom, but let's say like 
you know, eight to 10, you know, a, a thousand neurons wide, and you have like three or four of them going down. And then there's an, in, there's an, a, an encoding, a bottleneck. And the idea is that the input feature has dimensionality, maybe 10,000, the number of genes in your data set. But the bottleneck layer in the middle here is usually something much smaller, maybe three or four. And the idea is that by forcing, so, so there's, whenever you go from 10,000 dimensions to four dimensions, there's compression. And so you, whenever you do compression, some information is lost. But as you might be aware, looking at image compression, not all compression removes important information about a piece of data or an observation. It maybe just provides a denoising or it, provide, it removes extraneous information. So you might be able to you know, recapitulate 95% of the variation in this data set, looking only at three or four principal components. But here we would like not just to look at linear combinations of the input features, but actually look specifically for three or four dimensions that are useful for reconstructing the output. The idea, autoencoders are actually two networks that are trained together, together, an encoder and a decoder. And these boxes say that the encoder goes from input to the coding to the latent space or the bottleneck layer. And the decoder takes as input the output of the encoder. So the decoder takes those bottleneck representations and expands it into the output. And then the output is compared to the input. And the difference between them is our cost function. So if the autoencoder is giving you really bad output, backpropagation will alter all of the weights and values in the network such that you um, do a better job of reconstructing the original data. This, uh, right, okay, I was talking informational bottleneck, sort of this is idea of compression. So we have a neural network trained to copy its input to its output. Um, the hidden layer we could think of as a code or a dimensionality reduced representation or a compression of the input. We have our encoder F and our decoder, you know, which produces some uh, hidden, some uh, dimensionality reduced representation Z or latent representation Z. And then there's a decoder G of Z, which produces X prime or reconstructed output. And we'd like to minimize our cost function of the input given the decoder applied to the encoder, right? So F of X gives Z, G of Z gives X prime. So this is the same thing as seeing C of X comma X prime, the output of the network. And we have some cost function C that penalizes the difference between them. Now this mean squared error I mentioned before is one example, but may not be the only one. Um, and what I want to, you know, what we're actually going to talk about, and we're going to start by talking about a paper or a method from our lab. Um, this is a relatively simple idea. You have input, you'd like to compress the information and then be able to decompress it, right? So you're learning both the compression and a decompression algorithm or function simultaneously. What is that good for? Why is it nice to have a dimensionality reduced representation? And what other things can we do than maybe just say plotting the data? Um, so one of the things that we've talked about uh, or so one of the things that is really powerful is that a lot of the methods that we've talked about so far, you can actually tweak the way that a neural network runs in order to do a lot of different kinds of tasks, denoising, batch correction, imputation, a lot of these things actually we're going to show how relatively simple changes to how an autoencoder runs can perform all of these different kinds of tasks. So one of the things that I want to point out is that you know, we don't change the overall structure of the autoencoder. What we do are apply regularizations, which we discussed a little bit yesterday. So um, one of the first things I'm going to talk to you about is something called a denoising autoencoder. So the idea here is that you have some input that's noisy, right? We were talking about handwritten digits. This is just one of the most common data sets used in, for training neural networks, especially for autoencoders. And so the idea is that what if we have some you know, really good input data we add noise to that input data, use it as input to the network, and then have the network decode the, de the original version of the data. This is called a denoising autoencoder. So this is a different kind of regularization. And what we're trying to do is create output that is denoised from the input data. And one of the key ways that, we, that, that you can imagine doing this is that um, 
if you have a lot of noise, oftentimes this is extraneous. And we think that we can actually remove some of those features of the data in our dimensionality reduced representation so that when we're doing this compression, we're keeping some core fundamental patterns. Like we were talking about how there's like edges and there's continuity that neural networks can learn. Maybe the thing that's really important is to say, you know, recognize where there are places where there are continuous white pixels. But if you're in an area where it's sort of mixing between white and black, don't pay attention to that. So let's just keep where are the continuous white pixels. And that is our represent, you know, dimensionality reduced representation. And our output is going to look like this. This is actually, I think, a really, you know, maybe seems really complicated, but we're talking to talk a little bit about entropy. One of the things um, that's really interesting is that data like this, where there's a lot of noise, has really high entropy. And so you can actually simplify, you're going to remove entropy from the data set when you compress it. And so by doing that, we can create a denoise representation of the data. Um, one thing I'll, I'll just point out in the very beginning, we, when we talked about denoising, we talked about re removing some of the dimensions. So, for example, if you recreate your data from the first few PC components, it, it will be denoised because um, the really smooth directions of variations are the signal and the others are the noise. And that's exactly what the autoencoder is doing. It's um, removing some parts of your signal and then recreating the data. And as I mentioned, if you don't have nonlinear activations, autoencoders are equivalent to PCN. Um, great, uh, thank you, Smitha. Uh, let's see, okay. So um, we're gonna start and we're gonna talk about a paper uh, called Saucy, which is a multitasking, we're working on a multitasking neural network. Uh, and this was, um, this is a uh, paper that was published a couple years ago in Nutri Methods. I actually would uh, just went through the paper again yesterday. I would recommend reading some of the way that this paper is written. I think it's very straightforward and explains a lot of the regularizations I'm going to introduce right now in much in like relatively good plain English. And then in the methods goes and shows you how a lot of the equations that we use actually represent and calculate some of the concepts that we're talking about maybe in a little bit more of a high level way in this presentation in a more fundamental way uh, in the paper. So um, Saucy is a neural network that does a lot of different kinds of things. And the motivation for Saucy was a collaboration uh, at Yale um, with, actually Smitha, do you know who was the other, it was, um, who were the, the groups involved with this? It, it was mainly Ruth, but it's a collaboration with the Human Immunoprofiling Consortium Epstein, yeah. chapter of Yale. And so this is an NIH funded center to do immunology research. And there was a collection of samples from Zika and dengue patients, if I, under, if I remember correctly. Yeah, these are dengue patients they're and, all, you know, there are hundreds of them because this is all patient data. It's human immunoprofiling. Yeah, and so there was, you know, blood collected from dengue patients. I think there were like 120 or 180 or something like that. And the measurements that were collected was single cell RNA sequencing and, or no, maybe there was an RNA sequencing. I'm it was mass cytometry. It was mass cytometry. So this is pro high throughput proteomics. So for any one individual, you might have something like 200,000 cells. And for each of those cells, you have 80 or 40 different proteins that you're measuring. And the total data set was something on the order of 12 to 18 million cells. And a lot of the methods that we were talking about so far just do not scale to that kind of data set. You cannot easily build a graph and hold it in memory on a computer. Theoretically, it's possible, but computationally, it's impractical. And so this is a case where neural networks have to come in to allow us to do that kind of big scale processing of tens of millions of cells. So there's samples from many different kinds of patients. We've got tens of millions of cells. We have this gene expression matrix, cells by genes or proteins, and so samples for each of them. And Saucy is a pipeline that allows you to use one neural network in a couple of different ways to do cell type identification or clustering, to do visualization, identify dimensionality or nonlinear dimensionality reduction for visualization, to do denoising or imputation. I would say imputation here, actually I think probably denoising is a better is a better label. And batch normalization. One of the it's imputation in the sense that magic imputes it denoises. <laughs> 
yeah, so I think we're, I think, yeah, it's a phrase that I think is a little bit overloaded. And when we say it, we mean more uh, of, of the denoising sense. Um, and then batch normalization, right? There's a lot of different kinds of batch effects. I'm going to talk about exactly how we do it. Um, so the question when asked is this SCRNA-seq or PSYCOP data? So this is no data, really. I mean, I guess this is SCRNA-seq data in here. This is real data. Um, but the neural network runs on single cell RNA sequencing data or PSYCOP data. It doesn't matter. Uh, I think almost all of the methods we talk about, it doesn't actually matter what the features are. Uh, it runs, you can adapt these methods for any of them. Um, the data set that we were talking about, the dengue patient, was CYTOF data. Um, but this is just a cartoon schematic. Okay, so how do we do all of these different kinds of tasks? The answer is different regularizations on various layers of the neural network. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to start talking, you know, sort of one by one about how we do different kinds of uh, tasks. There's a regularization we apply on, a, on one of the hidden layers that we call information dimension regularization. One of the observations, and I'm gonna go a little bit more detail on the following slides, but one of the observations is that if you look at all of the cells in a data set and you say for a particular neuron, what's the activation between zero and one, that if you just take a random neural network, you get relatively uniform distribution across the activation spectrum. And this sort of makes sense because if you imagine having a dimension uh, if you have to compress information, you'd like to use as much of that dimension as possible if you'd like, if what your goal is, is to do reconstruction. However, what we would like to do is a kind of clustering, and we would like to have a code that we can use, a code of zeros or ones that can be decoded to do clustering, right? So here, you might imagine that these are each different layers of that clustering layer. And if we note, if we have one, zero, one, zero, that's one cluster. If we have zero, one, one, zero, that's a different cluster. If we have zero, 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 one, that might be a third cluster, right? These kind of zero, one binarizations uh, give us a code that we can then use to identify clusters. Um, we were talking before about doing denoising, and we can actually drop, you know, take single cell data or take, and then add more dropout and try to remove the dropout that was added to do some denoising in the same way that you might imagine setting some- We actually bulk. don't need to add any more dropout. The dimensionality reduction does it. I see, okay. I, that was That's a mistake on my part then. Um, but there is an experiment in the paper using digits where pixels were set randomly to zero to show that you can recover the, um, the yeah, original digits. Right. Uh, but I guess if you're actually training this on regular data, just viewing the compression allows you to, to get denoising yourself. Um, there is a bottleneck layer uh, that is both used for visualization. So there's two or three dimensions of this bottleneck layer. And then in that layer, I'm going to show you there's a regularization we use called maximal mean discrepancy or MMD that allows you to calculate, or sort of not calculate, but allows you to enforce cells from different batches to be similar to each other. So it sort of merges them on top of each other. Uh, and then finally, there's actually, so this, this sparse code, you know, is one, it, you have to, in order to do proper clustering, you need both this sparse code, but then also enforce that similar cells have similar final, have similar representations. Um, and so there's actually uh, intra-cluster regularization saying that cells that share the same code have to have similar output values uh, to sort of, this is our like similarity metric that we're using. So let's talk a little bit more about this like representation for clustering. So I was talking before about how you might have a neural network and it's cells are, you, you, know, cell, you pass a set of cells into that network and you get, you know, basically you want a neuron to either be activated or not activated. This is a binarization of the output. There's actually no, you know, you might think, well, is there a binary act, not just like say a, a, a true binary activation, right? We have these sigmoid curves that are sort of bounded by zero and one. Um, but in order to do differentiation properly, you can't give it a true a hard zero and one. Um, someone asked about if SAUCE uses uh, tensor, I think TF. Um, questions like that, I just would, I would uh, encourage you to direct to the chat. Uh, we're going to use it. We're going to use Saucy today, and I do believe that the current implementation is in TensorFlow. But um, 
for code stuff, I would, I would suggest uh, going up asking the Slack chat. Um, so representation for clustering, right? We want to have this activation activated or not activated state. So you can, have, oh, I guess we're, I suppose to change these. So the idea is that, you know, for this cluster, you might see this, uh, for cells that are in this cluster, you might have this neuron activated and none of these others. And for this one, just imagine that we've switched which of these neurons gets activated. And so what we're looking for is some binarization in that space. How do we actually enforce binarization if we can't just use an activation function that is really zero continuously and then just jumps up to one at some threshold, right? The cheese festival example, we had a harsh threshold. It turns out differentiation does not like piecewise functions that are zero below a threshold and one across a threshold. Um, but one of the things that we realized was that it's possible to apply uh, regularization on the entropy of the layer. So I was talking about, imagine these are four different cells and this is the activation between zero and one. Um, there you can, so the way that you can calculate entropy of a data set is taking the negative sum of the values times the log of the values. And these have to be proportions, these have to be fractions. And this works because the log of say 0.9 is less than the log of 0.1. And so if you have a uniform distribution, you're gonna have the highest possible uh, sum of the log times the value of the, um, of the input. And so just by calculating the entropy, you enforce for less uniform distribution of activations and more high, one high and then the most low. Um, you want to have the greatest sort of difference between the maximum and the mean across, you know, on average across the data set. So we can actually penalize this. This is just a cost function that you can calculate, you can differentiate, and then you can, um, you can apply to the network and say, okay, I want you to reconstruct plus I want uh, information, I want this uh, low entropy in one of the layers. You calculate it when you're doing backpropagation and gradient descent. And then the neural network just does it for you, which I think is really, uh, really powerful. And so what we what we see is that if you don't use this information regularization, you get relatively uniform with a few high activations. Um, another way you might think about doing this is just L1 regularization. You want to just have the sum of the weights. Um, you want to minimize the sum of the weights across all the data set. Maybe have one high value and the most lower. Um, but what we actually see is that if you use uh, uh, this entropy regularization, it maybe is a little bit hard to see here because of the bins and there's such high mass right at zero and hot and at one, but we actually get much more of this sort of binarization of the activations for a, an individual node across the data set. And you can use this now to get a code that you can use for clustering. So that, you know, here's one thing you can do. You add this entropy regularization, you get clustering out of an autoencoder. What else can we do? So let's imagine that you have a data set and there's a huge batch effect between it. This is real data from that uh, Dengue data set I was talking about uh, in the beginning. This is Cytoc data. We have two patients. We know that they have the same composition of blood cells. But one of the things that happens in autoencoders is that they basically can sort information in their latent representation such that you don't necessarily have good mixing between points that are actually similar. Uh, you know, an autoencoder is capable of learning the difference between 0 0.0001 and 0 0.0002 it, to arbitrary precision. And so you don't have to have mixing between them. One of the ways that we can actually enforce good mixing between data sets and keep them from separating out data sets from different patients is using a measure called maximal mean discrepancy. And maximal mean discrepancy is a measure, uh, if you were at um, the, a trajectory net lecture yesterday. It's somewhat similar to KL divergence. Um, the basic idea is that if you have two distributions, you can calculate the amount of overlap between the two of them. Um, and this is, is, is a measure that actually gives you a way to say, you know, how much mixing or not mixing do I do? And you want to minimize the discrepancy between the data sets. So one of the things that's interesting to think about here is that actually, so there's always going to be a trade-off, right? If I want really good mixing in the bottleneck layer, uh, it might be a, it, it's going to be opposed by your reconstruction because reconstruction says, give me back the original data. I want all of the differences that I can get. But maximum discrepancy says, give me a representation where everything is mixed. 
And so if all of the points were directly on top of each other uh, across you know, both of the data sets, imagine that you had two points that are directly encoded to the same spot, you're not gonna be able to output two different values. In the raw feature space, there were two different values, but if they project to the same point in the latent space, then there's no way to learn a function that separates them again. Neural networks are deterministic. If you have the same encoding, you're gonna have the same output. And so there's this balance now. And a lot of using neural networks and tuning neural networks is finding the right balance in your set of cost functions, right? How much do you wanna prioritize your perfect blending where you have zero discrepancy between the data sets and perfect reconstruction? Um, and actually you can see that as you change this lambda V is the lambda, uh, the how much weight you apply to the maximum discrepancy versus the reconstruction. And what I hope you can see is that as you change this balance, you go from zero to 0.1, for example, what you see is that you get more and more mixing between the data sets to where you actually get you know, better batch correction with higher values, uh, but maybe your reconstruction penalty here, if this is what your input data looked like, and this is the output after batch normalization, there's a big difference between these two, the, the output and the input. You have, to, you have to say to the neural network, that's okay, we care more that they're somewhat together. Um, just to go back to the previous slide, um, because I do realize that people went to, perhaps some people went to that trajectory net lecture. Uh -huh. MND is actually a distance between distributions, and mm -hmm. therefore it's very similar to the optimal transport distance, or EMD, that was spoken about yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is MMD can be computed on specific batches, and it's differentiable. So you can use it as a penalty within a neural network. It's sort of a simple kernel-based computation of uh, distances of points within a batch versus across a batch. So it's sort of a differentiable, easy to compute version of a distance between distributions. Yeah, and that, um, that differentiable part is I think one of the most important things. There is a limit in neural networks to doing training. Your functions have to be differentiable. And so if you have a non-differentiable function, it's going to be very difficult to figure out a way to integrate that into neural network training. Um, someone asked, what are saucy dimensions? Uh, and I think I just want to make it clear, when we are looking at visualizations of the data, saucy one and saucy two, we're actually looking at, so this is, this is one circle here, but actually it's two. There's, uh, there's two dimensions, excuse me. And there's a, instead of using a rectified linear unit or, or ReLU or a sigmoid output from this layer, it's linear. And so we actually force the neural network to represent each data point as a linear combination of these two dimensions, which allows them to be used as like a visualization. And so this is actually the, the there's two nodes in the bottleneck layer you feed it, you know, data into the neural network, and then you get the activation for node one, and that's the x-axis, and then you get the activation for node two, and that's the y-axis. So these are actually the activations that we're talking about, right? So you can imagine if we applied that entropy regularization on this bottleneck layer, we would not get a good visualization because it would, it would say, give me values mostly on the right and on the left and on the top and on the bottom, and you just really get data in like four points in each of the four corners, right? So um, in fact, I would say that uh, it, if you use the entropy regularization anywhere because of back back propagation, that information propagates and you do get more and more separated embeddings, kind of like T smear, you know. Yeah, it's going to okay. give you more. Yeah, it's going to give you more differences between them. Um, okay, so we, as Smith mentioned before, one of the ways that we can do, uh, well, this is the fundamental idea of training denoising autoencoders. You have some original data. You can imagine dropping out values. You can just take random, so this is a set of pixels, which is 724 pixels. And you can just set some of the values randomly to zero. So you can say, let's take 80% of the values here and just set them to zero, even if they were one, for example, which is somewhat similar to what we think is happening in single cell data, just some of the genes we're not detecting. Uh, or you might just count them. You might not, maybe not, actually you're gonna take that back. That's not what we think is happening in cellular cell data, single cell data. We think that we're getting just lower counts uh, so it's more of like a negative binomial, but you can imagine um, this just results in lower values than what you originally saw. So when I was talking about comparing, so you might have original data, you drop out some data, you feed that into the autoencoder, and then you get reconstructed data on the output, and then you do reconstruction error between that reconstructed output and the middle, 
it turns out if you do enough dimensionality reduction, you actually can get sort of this denoising quote unquote for free. Um, and you can see here some, 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 some comparisons across a single cell data set um, of Saucy to Magic. You can see the results are somewhat similar. Uh, the difference is that it would be impossible, well, it's not impossible, but for some data sets that you can run Saucy on, it would be almost impossible to run Magic just because of the size of the data sets. And we can see actually we get what looks like better performance than things like uh, SC Impute or just nearest neighbor completion. Okay, so so far we've talked about visualization, clustering, denoising, and batch correction. Uh, one of the things that we've also, you know, did in this data set in, in, that was that was done in Saucy was looking at um, manifolds over data sets, where we want to understand the relationship between patients. And what you can see, so this is our Saucy dimensions. These are the encodings of the latent space for that Dengue data set. This is a density plot of the of the latent representation of all of the acutely infected patients all of the healthy controls, and then all the convalescent patients. And if you remember from MELD, we were talking about comparing densities of data sets. You can imagine similarly here, you might wanna look at comparing the difference in density between acute, healthy, and convalescent. But I hope you can see is that actually, you know, interestingly, there are some overlap in between the acute and convalescent. These are patients who got infected again. Um, and, there, there's sort of this like natural path where acute and convalescent are more similar than acute and healthy uh, and, and vice versa. We can see some, there's similarities and differences. And so one of the things that you can do is actually take 180 samples, so it was 180, and your 18 million cells, get the clusters from that latent representation, and now characterize those clusters. So say for the, all the cells with a particular code, in that information mentioned regularized representation, we can say, what are the genes that are expressed there? And, and look at the differences between each of those set of clusters, just like you might've done using your regular k-means clustering, just at a wildly increased scale. And then what we can do is actually look at this, just so we now have distributions, right? Each patient has a proportion of cells in each of these clusters. And what now we can do is actually calculate the difference between those distributions across those clusters and say, you know, if there are certain kinds of values for acute, so these are categories, acute and convalescent versus healthy, we can actually start to calculate um, the proportion for each, you know, each sample. Uh, we can calculate distances between these using MMD. And then finally get out an embedding. Yes, this is done without down, down sampling. This is on all 18 million cells. Um, what we can do is then actually create a new visualization using something like kernel PCA on the using the distance matrix, the or the discrepancy matrix, the max the discrepancy between each of the set of samples to create a new embedding of the data. Where now instead of each point being a cell, each point is a patient, and the distance between the two points on this plot is actually how similar the patients are. And so we can calculate now the density of each of the patient representations and look at, you know, for example, how much of that sample it belongs to cluster one, three, five, or nine. We can then look at the density of each of those patients off of this PCA space. Um, there's a lot of interesting ways that you can now start to compare samples. So we're comparing distributions instead of just comparing, um, just comparing the, the cells. And one of the things that's really important about this is, as you know, here we're looking at dimensionality reduction, but one of the things that happens is um, as you get into the tens of millions, or I think this is hundreds, this is tens of millions of cells, um, that there are some methods that just fail to complete. Uh, so phenograph here is a cluster, these are a mix of clustering and visualization algorithms that the runtime just gets- And batch normalization algorithm. Oh, is it everything? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah so, I guess it is. So Saucy is the only thing that can do anything close to the scale of batch normalization. Most batch normalization methods are shown on two data sets. We batch normalized 180 data sets together here. Yes. Yeah, and so you can see like CCA, one of those batch normalization data methods we were describing earlier, you know, basically fails to run on data sets of larger than like 50,000 cells using the implementation that we tried.
Uh, and so with that, I'm going to hand things off to Smitha, who is going to talk about generative models. But I guess uh, I understand, Smitha, you need to make sure your daughter. Oh, yeah, no, I class. think I think she's there. She's, she's OK, the great. So if you want to just take over, do you want to just start presenting from your screen or do you want to take uh, control of mine? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll present from my, my screen. I just have to get to the. OK, great. So I'm just going to turn off. Right here. So. Um, I'm just going to share the screen. Hopefully you got an idea of how neural networks can be used in an unsupervised way, in particular autoencoders, to give you an interesting and meaningful representation of single cell data from which you can do many different tasks. Um, as somebody who is like very interested in uh, unsupervised learning, it's kind of interesting for me to note that a lot of the salient applications of neural networks do um, yeah, a lot of salient applications of neural networks to single cell analysis have been unsupervised. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. This is why we were covering a lot of unsupervised analysis in the first weeks of the class, because you're just trying to explore the structure and see what the data gives you rather than uh, just trying to impose classifications or something like that. So another topic in unsupervised learning that we actually haven't covered much before. So the stuff that the autoencoder was doing, perhaps uh, there's a lot of other methods out there that kind of do it, but there's some advantages for doing it in the autoencoder. You can do it all together. You can do it at high scale. You can you know, put all the penalties in at once so that you have one pipeline running all this. So there, there could be advantages to doing it in the neural network, but generative models are really, you know, one of the concepts that are most famous for neural networks doing them. People weren't doing such complicated gener generative models before neural networks. So what is a generative model? And I know that in biology, um, they're not super common, but it turns out they're actually very, very useful. Um, Dan, just let me know if my slides are okay. Um, Looks fine. Okay, um, the idea is that you can generate samples uh, that you did not measure but that look like they're coming from the same data set that you um, you have that you have measured. Um, and so, you know, in some biomedical applications, you think you have a bunch of patient data to train, but you don't want to release any one patient data. You can uh, generate data that's distributed like that, like the patient cohorts data. Um, and it turns out that that's not the only use of them. And we're going to continue to talk about generative models. Generative models can also be useful if you have one kind of modality of data or one batch of data and you want to convert it or generate another batch from it. Uh, or if you have single cell RNA sequencing and you want to generate the ATAC seq from it so that you get a matching set of measurements, kind of translation tasks as well. Um, and so you can think about starting to do this with an autoencoder. Okay. The idea would be in order to generate something that looks like something from the data, you'd sample somewhere in your latent layer, the one that we visualized with Saucy1, Saucy2, and just simply put it out of the decoder, and that'll decode it out to whatever the original measurement was, you know, with some denoising and things like that. Um, and there you have a new sample that wasn't originally measured, and it's in the data. Um, for single cell data, this would mean that you are generating synthetic cells from some high dimensional distribution, but the advantage is you don't have to know the distribution. The autoencoder or neural network has learned, learned the distribution. But it turns out that just the vanilla neural networks, um, like Saucy is, it's sort of a, I'd like to say, kind of a tricked out, but vanilla neural network. Uh, there is another kind of neural network, actually there are several other kinds, but in particular one popular kind of neural network that is actually meant for sampling in the latent layer and therefore generating new, new data. And this kind of neural network is called a variational autoencoder. And it has a very specifically designed latent space so that you can sample from the latent space and decode um, the data at the output. Um, so the, uh, why not just use regular autoencoders? Um, there are some problems with using regular autoencoders for generative purposes, and I'll show one of these problems to you. One of these problems could be that if you're autoencoding data and you look at the embedding or the latent layer, there's discontinuities in this layer. So if I randomly sampled here, let's say I sampled here, it's not clear what if any of the digits it would decode to. So once again, what we've done is we've taken those MNIST handwritten digits 
that we showed yesterday. We've run them through an autoencoder. And this is what the embedding looks like. These are where all the ones decode. These are where the sevens decode, um, you know, several, several other digits. Um, and in fact, there's some overlap between the digits as well. And then there's a lot of these kind of empty areas where if I tried to generate from this point, who knows what that is. And that's called uh, latent space interpolation. It seems that in regular autoencoder, you cannot take two points from your training data and interpolate between them and have a reasonable point also from your training data come out. And so this is actually really what variational autoencoders help with. Um, and, and the variational penalty helps with um, if you don't even want to sort of think about the variational inference aspect of it. Uh, the primary thing we're interested in is getting a la layer that is contiguous like this. That means that if I have two points that are from the training data, I can go anywhere in between them, and this will decode out to a point in the training data. So you actually see there's kind of a buffer zone around every point, or a little bit of um, a noise around every point you can think of it as. And anywhere in here will decode to the same digit as this. But if you cross this boundary and you go in here, anywhere in here will decode to whatever this was decoding to. So it has this contiguous quality. Um, so, but you might think that it's enough to add sort of this kind of buffer around every point so that these points are all combining, you know, what if these all had sort of buffers. Uh, but just the buffering around or noise around every point is not going to be enough because you can have noise around points, but you can still spread the points out. Um, so you need something that actually pulls the points together into a continuous, uh, contiguous or kind of conjoined uh, space. This is what the uh, main novel penalty in a variational autoencoder actually does. What it does is it has um, a distribution in space that all decodes back to that particular point. Um, and the, what it's penalizing is it's penalizing this whole distribution, this whole point cloud of stuff that decodes here, uh, for being far away from zero mean one standard deviation. So what it's doing is it's pulling all these little point clouds towards the same point cloud so that you uh, can pull all of these kind of clouds together and get something that looks like this. But of course, if you just applied um, the KL divergence penalty that is pulling all of them over here, they're just going to overlap like this. And you're not going to get any meaningful interpolation here either. So what you actually need is a balance between the reconstruction error, which says, you know, if you sample here, you got to reconstruct to the one. If you sample here, you have to reconstruct to the two. Um, and this idea that you want to pull the point cloud around this point that all gets reconstructed at this point together. Um, and so therefore, there is a balance of these penalties. And a lot, in a lot of times, like if you take my, my deep learning class or other deep learning classes, you'll actually hear about uh, regularized autoencoders um, or even regular autoencoders without regularization as playing some sort of a game. So there is one um, force that's stressing the reconstruction that they have to reconstruct correctly. But there's another force that's taking away them away from perfect reconstruction, because perfect reconstruction is often useless. So if you just wanted to reconstruct perfectly, you would never reduce dimensions. But the dimensionality reduction is a force that pulls against the perfect reconstruction and gives you something meaningful. So we have the same kind of trade off here in VAEs. We have this KL divergence penalty that's penalizing for these uh, point clouds from being different than the zero mean one standard deviation normal distribution. That's this KL divergence penalty. And we have another penalty that's sometimes written like this. This is your reconstruction penalty. Uh, it's saying that if you sample anywhere in here with high likelihood, you will get uh, the point X where you came from back. Sorry. Um, if you sample anywhere here, you'll get the point X that was encoding to the center back. 
And so these are the two parts. This is called the likelihood penalty. Sometimes people um, substitute this with an ordinary mean squared error reconstruction. This is the KL divergence penalty that actually puts a prior on you know, the shape of the region in the latent space that decodes any particular training data. Um, and so when you, when you combine these two losses, you get a different looking latent layer, one that is much more contiguous and one where you can take two data points and pretty safely interpolate between them and get out a new data point. And so this latent layer is a lot more amenable for data generation, which you can think of as sampling in this latent space and getting a point that's distributed like your data. Um, so um, variational autoencoders are trained just like your regular autoencoders. Initially, they're not going to be very good at decoding, but finally, they can be, you know, just as good at decoding as your other autoencoders. Um, so it's a question of reaching this kind of um, balance where the latent layer has the kind of shape that you need, and yet you're reconstructing correctly. Bar no screaming. <laughs> Sorry, Wednesdays are the day my kids would have homeschool, uh, as you remember from last Wednesday, and I had to say the same thing. Um, so there is a variational autoencoder that is prominently used in single cell analysis, and this is this method called SCVI. Um, and that's why um, even though sometimes people don't use SCVI for this purpose, it is called a deep generative model for single cell data because VAEs are um, inherently generative. So what SCVI is doing um, can be fairly complex to understand. Um, and the reason is because it has a very structured latent layer. So a lot of what it does is similar to Saucy, uh, but Saucy is more or less using the dimensionality reduction capabilities of the neural network and directing the dimensionality reduction so that it just does the batch normalization and things like that. Uh, instead, what VAE is doing is it's applying a series of prior distributions, kind of like the normal zero and one, to learn certain things. It's, it has a prior distribution and variables, parametric variables pertaining to that prior distribution to learn cell specific scaling, dropout, and things like that. And this is information that you can use outside the network to scale it. So um, just to go back and give you an example, what the VAE actually learns when you have this kind of setup is it's actually learning for every point a mean and a standard deviation. So it's learning parameters of a parametric distribution. Um, so in VAE, they're structuring, structuring those parameters so that they have a lot of different meanings. So cell sizes, um, amount of dropout, batch, et cetera. And so when they train the autoencoder, they get a series of parameters out. So what are the parameters they're using? They have a wide variety of parametric assumptions built into SCVI. Um, so again, the latent space is amenable for generation because they use the same normal zero one penalty that's in most uh, autoencoders. Um, but they have other um, other assumptions on the shape and distributions of genes, batches, and noise. And um, these distributions uh, can be interesting because you can read off some of these parameters and they might tell you something about the batch effect, but they might also be a little bit misleading if the real data doesn't actually follow these parametric distributions. And in fact, one of the distributions that is used very prominently in SCVI is this zero inflated negative binomial assumption uh, for the way genes are distributed, which a lot of people have argued doesn't follow the realistic uh, distributions at all. But um, this is one of the ways that um, SEVI, like Saucy, actually uh, comes up with um, di distribution specific ways of clustering, visualization, and, and batch removal as well. Um, they learn this batch variable that's distributed a cer certain way. Um, so the another thing that you can do in the latent space, in addition to generation, is something that's called latent space arithmetic. 
This is actually a kind of cool idea that's based on the geometry of the latent space. So one of the interesting features of the latent space is that um, you can, you know, it's contiguous, so you can interpolate. But another um, latent feature of the latent space could be that um, you have a structure to the latent space where you can mimic things like perturbations. One of the neural networks that takes advantage of this, which is called latent space arithmetic. So let me explain this a little bit. So if you embed these images into the latent space of an autoencoder, um, you have images of women who are smiling, and you have images of women that are not smiling. And you could figure out you know the vector of coordinates for the women who are smiling and not and the women who are not smiling uh, you could also figure out the coordinates for men who are neutral so um if you subtract this you if you isolate the direction in the latent space that's responsible for the smile versus no smile so those are basically the differences between these women and you add to those the direction that decodes to men, you can actually create a smiling man given these. And this is what's called as latent space arithmetic. And it works to a lesser or more extent, depending on what your features are and what your training data is. So there has been a neural network that was published a couple of years ago called SCGen that tries to model perturbations on single cells using latent space arithmetic. So what they do is, certain conditions, they have both uh, cells that are unperturbed and cells that are perturbed. So let's assume you have cells from these particular conditions and you understand what the transformation is between the unperturbed and perturbed. So now if you have a new cell type, you can just apply this transformation again and you can acquire perturbed cells from this new condition that you hadn't measured. So this is also a type of generation. So you're uh, transforming the latent space representation in a particular way, and you're generating perturbed cells from it. Um, the next set of applications that I'll talk about uh, use a different generative model. Uh, they don't use an autoencoder. So thus far, we've been talking about autoencoders used as dimensionality reduction, denoising, batch normalization, and data generation. But there is maybe an even more popular method for um, generative for data generation, and these are the so-called GANs or generative adversarial networks. So GANs are different from autoencoders in that they don't have an encoder and a decoder. It's kind of like um, having just a decoder. So um, one way that GANs have been useful is just from going from pure noise. Um, so uniformly distributed noise to something like the training sample. So what the GAN is doing is it's transmuting a sample from a very easy to generate distribution like uniform or Gaussian distribution. And it's um, taking that and transforming it to an element from a very complicated distribution, uh, very high dimensional often, which is um, the space of your training data and in mnist handwritten digits it's like this very complex highly structured 784 dimensional distribution and that's what the gans are doing they're kind of transmuting from one distribution to another if you don't have a specific other distribution usually you just use noise and train the gan to go towards your data distribution um the way the gan functions is that it actually has two different networks so one is called a generator and a the other one's called a discriminator. And you only use the discriminator during the training. Um, what you have for the generator is you have some noise. You know, this is an input random variable, like a uniform random variable. And you just put it through the generator. The generator will change it in some way. So let's say it changes it like this. And then you feed it to the discriminator. And you're basically asking the discriminator does whatever my generator outputted look similar to the training data I have? Notice you never put your training data in the input. You're just using the training data uh, for the discriminator. And the way you ask that is, 
you randomly alternate putting into the discriminator samples from your training data and samples from your regular data um, and you're training it to classify and if the neural network can um, if this neural network can tell the difference between these two uh, between what's generated for example in your real training data then that means that the generative network has more work to do um, so you pass the gradient from here back through the generator and the generator gets better and then after the generator is getting better, you're training the discriminator. So the discriminator is getting better. And so it's a back and forth between these two. And that's why it's called a generative adversarial net. This is sometimes uh, what a schematic of a GAN looks like. You're taking random noise and you're generating a fake image. You have your training set of real images and you're training the discriminator to discriminate between these two. So you're really training it to be sharper and sharper. As your generator is getting better, your discriminator has to get sharper uh, at distinguishing the differences so you can fine tune your generator into making very realistic um, samples. So the generator is the one that learns this mapping. The discriminator try is, a, is basically a classifier. Uh, which we talked about before that tries to distinguish true examples from the tra training set from the so-called so fake examples from the generator. Um, these two networks are set to play a minimax game and this turns out to be an indirect way of matching distributions and actually if you um, regularize the weights in uh, the discriminator correctly it turns out to be a way of minimizing Wasserstein or earth movers distance without actually using it explicitly as a penalty. So when you use a GAN, you don't use the discriminator anymore. You just use the generator and the generator has been trained to uh, output realistic images. And so you can think of the GAN as a system that implicitly learns high dimensional distributions. You never had to estimate the density. You never had to describe the distribution in any explicit terms. It just implicitly learned it from the training data that you gave it. Um, one of the reasons GANs became so popular is um, autoencoders and especially variational autoencoders um, take off some of the dimensions of your data. And sometimes they can result in sort of blurry looking images like these blurry faces, but GANs aren't necessarily doing that. And so they can actually be trained to generate very sharp images. And so in the image realm, it was really like um, clear the difference uh, and the improvement in GANs as far as their generating ability. If you're curious what the loss function of a GAN looks like, um, it kind of looks like this, where uh, what you're trying to do is uh, you're maximizing the value of the discriminator uh, on real samples, um, and you're maximizing the value of the generator on uh, so you're minimizing the value of the discriminator on generated value. So you have this one minus for the output from the generator. And you don't have that one minus in the output from the discriminator. And you're adding these two together. And then the generator's loss is just opposite the discriminator's loss. So the generator uses the same loss, but it's trying to minimize this loss. So that's why this is a minimax game. So you're, the discriminator is trying to maximize the same loss function. The generator is trying to minimize it and you alternate the trainings and that's 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 how it works. Um, there are some problems with training GANs. They can be kind of finicky. They can be a little bit difficult to train, you know, if you're not used to training them. Uh, one of the famous problems about that people have reported on GANs is the so-called mode collapse. The generator can fool the discriminator by memorizing a small number of images. So there's no guarantee that it's going to spread across the space of your data and generate everything in your data. And so for that, you need additional penalties that ensure that the variance of the generated data is similar to the variance of your regular data and, and, and sort of batch level penalties. They can also be unstable during training because there's this game, so they can keep oscillating. Um, but um, people have found ways of making GANs work. One of the um, solutions to this problem of diversity is to be very specific about what you generate. And this is where conditional GANs come in. Uh, conditional GANs say what from the data you should specifically generate. So in the example of MNIST digits, instead of saying just generate me any digit and your GAN is just giving you seven after seven after seven, uh, or three after three after three, you're going to say, oh, explicitly generate me a seven and it'll go generate a seven. 
And that's what a conditional GAN is. A conditional GAN is actually quite a simple modification on a regular GAN. So we have uh, some labels on the data, uh, but these labels are used to teach the generator to generate some specific subset of the data. That's the setup for a conditional GAN. So the schematic of a conditional GAN looks actually quite similar to the regular GAN, except you also feed the condition into the generator. And you actually have to feed the condition into the discriminator too to make sure you're discriminating the same thing. So both the condition and the discriminate, both the generation and the discrimination is conditional uh, with respect to whatever condition you're giving it. And that way you can be a little bit more specific about what you're trying to generate. Um, there is also a conditional GAN. Um, actually, uh, our lab has also developed a conditional GAN that's not necessarily just for single cell data, but that's still under review. Um, there was one last year from Stefan Bond's lab in Germany, um, where they are trying to actually generate uh, single cell RNA sequencing data that's sort of fake to augment the data sets you have for analysis to maybe solve problems of imbalance. So the, the conditions that they give are types of cells that are found in PBMCs. So these are immune cell types, CD4, CD8, CD19. And some of these immune cell types can naturally be rare. So if you just measure this data, you might get a lot of CD4s and get almost no natural killers. And if you're doing some kind of analysis or patient to patient comparison, you just want there to be more NK cells. If you want those to have a bigger impact on your entire data set, then you would augment it. Um, they show um, that the generated data closely projects onto the clusters, for example, the clusters that are vi visualized in um, TSNE. Um, here, there's a specific uh, cluster of data, and here's where the um, real data is, and here's where the SCGAN generated it. So you're seeing it takes up the same area, but it's just different cells. And that's what they're showing that they're doing realistic generation of it. Um, Another way of using GANs is for, uh, I would call it data integration or domain adaptation. And uh, for this setup um, in machine learning, a popular paradigm is cycle GANs. We hadn't necessarily seen that too much in the biomedical sciences or single cell data. So our, our lab developed a cycle GAN that can be used for domain adaptation or batch correction because um, you'll see that both of these tasks kind of fit into this framework. Um, so when I described GANs, uh, initially I showed you how they go from a noise distribution to a data distribution, but it doesn't have to be from a noise distribution. They can go from a real distribution A coming from domain A to a distribution B coming from domain B. Um, an example can be you could feed again um, data that's coming from single cell RNA sequencing and generate single cell ataxic data. These are related domains and you want to train the GAN to transmute these data sets to something realistic. It could be control data and perturbation data. It could be data from batch one that you're converting to batch two. So you see that this idea of transforming probability distributions that GANs do is very generic and you, and you can use it for, for sort of all these tasks. Um, and but the question is, can we learn to turn a point from A, so let's say single cell RNA sequencing, to single cell ATAC sequencing when we don't have the same entities measured in both the cells. We just have a population of cells that we measured in RNA-seq and a population of cells measured in ATAC-seq. Um, and it turns out that GANs that can actually uh, do this job and they'll do it better if you regularize them in certain ways. So one of the first uh, of these kinds of cycle GANs that came out was this DISCO GAN. Um, it's kind of weird to see, but in machine learning, you often have these kind of strange applications that have no use, <laughs> but um, you'll, you'll see what they do because they're usually images. You have domain A being celebrities who have blonde hair, uh, domain B are celebrities who have black hair, 
Um, and um, you can think about just changing a celebrity from blonde hair to black hair, but if but the idea is uh, you want to kind of constrain which celebrity with black hair that they convert to. It's kind of like you just want to dye this person's hair, but you don't want to change their identity. Um, so for that, um, the cycle GAN solution is to actually use two GANs back to back. So you have GAN A and GAN that goes from A to B, and then another GAN that goes from B to A. So you can test that this image that you have uh, here is actually from domain B because you have instances from domain B. You can check that the one that uh, you've generated here is actually from domain A because you have realistic samples from domain A. But in addition, what you wanna do is you wanna um, join these two GANs together so that if you took a celebrity with blonde hair, turn them into a celebrity with black hair, and turn them back into a celebrity with blonde hair, you'd get something very similar back. And that's called the cycle consistency. And the cycle consistency penalty uh, is added to this, um, this setup, and it's gonna look like this. It's gonna look like a reconstruction penalty here, where you've stacked these two GANs side by side in both these directions, and you're making sure that these are similar using actually like a reconstruction error from a reconstruction penalty from an autoencoder. So these two GANs back to back kind of create like a big autoencoder and you're using reconstruction penalty and you're using a lot of weight sharing. Um, and so the output of the disco GAN is somewhat more consistent and you haven't told it what the celebrity looks like when they have their hair dyed, like you don't have another picture of them with black hair, but yet this cycle consistency is somehow constraining domain one and domain two so that they're quite similar. So here the domain one is like outlines of these bags, domain two are photographs of these bags. And you see there is some kind of inherent similarity between these two, it didn't uh, turn this outline into this bag or anything like that. Um, so this was promising to us, but, um, it still wasn't accurate enough. Um, for example, is this the correct shoe for this purse? Is there a better match? Um, the original paper doesn't talk much about it besides hoping that the cycle consistency really solves most of these problems. And so this is uh, where uh, we started to develop this idea um, called Megan for actually aligning bi biological data where you have quite a bit more information about is this the correct shoe for the purse? Meaning is this the correct ataxic measurement for the RNA-seq measurement? Because there's a lot more information in biomedical data. For example, if there's a chromatin region closed, then it can be expressed and you shouldn't have measurements in closed areas, for example. And so these kinds of constraints naturally arise in, in biology. And so the Megan architecture actually adds one more loss called a correspondence loss. And this correspondence clause can be designed based on your domain knowledge. Um, so this, this actually ensures not only the cycle consistency, but also specifically says these two really correspond. You know, you can imagine yesterday where we're talking the amount of black in a pixel. That could be a correspondence loss. Maybe you penalize the amount difference in the amount of black in this image. So these kinds of things can be added uh, as correspondences. Um, and the correspondence loss um, can often be um, enforced using fairly simplistic kinds of knowledge. So here in the paper, we show an example where uh, we have a bunch of immune cells we have that are subsets of T cells, regulatory helper, uh, cytotoxic killer T cells. And if you just apply something like a disco GAN, these all get scrambled. But when we introduce the correspondence penalty, these line up again. Um, so one of the examples we show is two different batches. Without the correspondence penalty, we have different kinds of T cells mixing. But what you can do between these batches is you can enforce that the range of certain markers stay the same and then you'll ensure uh, alignment. Um, so one thing that we did was we're looking at the correlation between the real and predicted values of the input and output batch domain. And the correlation is the same, though the magnitude is different. 
And the magnitude shifts are really encoding the best normalization. Um, another example we did this on was when we had a subset of markers uh, that were shared, but a lot of markers that are not shared. So we had two different Cytoff panels that share 10 markers, but we're trying to combine these Cytoff panels and we want a data set with 70 markers, which is far beyond the capability of what Cytoff gives. Usually it gives 20 to 30 markers. We want 70. So what we did was together with our collaborator design a data set that has um, 30 markers that are unique and 10 in common to give you a total of 70 instead of 80. And we can just use the correspondence on those 10 markers, custom design correspondence loss on just those 10 markers to generate the data with all 70 markers. So that's that's something that's shown, shown in the paper. So these are examples of GANs that are used for domain adaptation, integration, uh, batch normalization, and, and just data generation plane. Um, so hopefully this gives you an idea of how these generative and autoencoder models uh, are used in single cell analysis. Um, another example we showed here is the rotated MNIST digits. Um, without the correspondence loss, for example, the amount of black in each image, you can turn straight threes into rotated sevens. But when you add the correspondence loss with much higher likelihood, you turn straight threes in, into rotated uh, threes. Um, so that's sort of the end of this lecture. Um, we ended a little bit early, actually. So let me know if you have any questions and make sure you fill out the end of the course survey. I'm sorry, I'm also realizing that this is the old, uh, the old link. I'm just going to send oh, it's not the right link. In the chat. Oh, it's a mini link, sorry. Um, did but we can maybe take the next chat? 10 minutes of people, you know, actually after uh, Samantha, you weren't there, but after Alex's talk yesterday, a bunch of people just sort of asked questions. We had a little bit of a panel discussion. It might be useful if you want to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. If anyone wants to just sort of ask any final questions they have about the workshop or uh, any of the topics that we've discussed, um, you know, now is a good time. Just feel free to unmute yourself uh, and ask any questions or, you know, mentions in the chat um, are also valid. So uh, someone asked for the last slides, what about six and nine? Rotation has information. I mean, it's pretty generic, right? Most of these methods can be used on not specific to digits. Can GANs be used to generate time series data? Um, yeah, I mean, so if you have fixed length time series data, you could put it into, into a GAN, you know, you have training data and you can generate it. Uh, if you have variable length, you might want to use sort of a different model like uh, RNN or transformer or some kind of sequential model. Thanks. Can you talk a little bit more about saucy clusters and the concept of binarization? That's right. So when we interpret clusters out of the saucy sort of clustering layer, we binarize each activation. So it gives us a code for each cell. Um, the number of clusters is not explicitly selected, a little bit like Louvain or something. It's implicitly selected by how high you weight the information dimension regularization, Alex, for Anna, <laughs> not you, Alex. Um, I have a question about um, deep learning more in general. Uh, how do you pick uh, the appropriate cost function? Is it kind of like the activation function when you just pick ReLU, or is there more nuance into how you decide the cost? Um, for which network? For uh, like when you're deciding to do building a network or training in general, like. I'm going to decide to use mean squared error. Uh, this I think time. the cost function has to be designed very carefully. Remember, the regularizations all also go into the cost function, so it's a matter of deciding all the regularizations you need. Hmm. Um, so all of all of the stuff that goes into a neural network has to be very carefully designed. Thanks.
Uh, someone just asked me about uh, if they have further questions after the workshop, what's the best way to the Slack. Get answers. And yeah, so I'd recommend that Slack that we're using. We're probably going to start to retire some of the channels that we're using specifically for this workshop. Um, you can continue to message there maybe for like the next week or so, but beyond then, uh, if you notice, there's a bunch of channels for a specific method. There's also a general channel for questions. That's a good place to um, to reach out if you have specific questions about data. Um, some somebody here, uh, Van Wang, had a question. What are the pros and cons of using neural networks to do single cell RNA sequencing analysis, such as dimensionality reduction, batch correction, than non-neural network tools? Um, some non-neural network tools can be more stable. Neural networks can be made to scale easier because they're run on GPUs or clusters of GPUs. So like Saucy ran 20 million cells in, in some small amount of time just because you can, you can parallelize the, the, the running of them um, on, on uh, different kinds of machines. Um, Neural networks are a little bit more flexible. So for example, TSNI has one single penalty that it's optimizing for and neural networks, you can really design it so that you have all these, like Saucy had four different penalties that were carefully like tuned. So neural networks can be very flexible as long as you're putting in kind of differentiable penalties. Non-neural network methods are often single use. Neural networks also Im implicitly learn a representation sort of at every layer. So in a way, if you want to, you can, find out how the neural network is transforming the data down to some classification a little bit easier than in some of these other algorithms that just kind of spit out the answer. Can you talk how about how did you go about figuring out the architecture of the Saucy network, like the number of layers and the number of nodes in each layer? A lot of that is by trial and error. We knew we wanted to have a certain number of layers uh, just because deep neural networks can have are more powerful at transforming, uh, then we wanted at least one layer to have that clustering structure. Um, so, uh, and then usually autoencoders have the same number of input uh, encoder layers as decoders. So, Saucy has like five layers, you know, basically three in the encoder, three in the decoder. Well, one that's shared, and one of the decoder layers has the clustering penalty. There is a lot of work in machine learning. Matan is asking, are there works on fine tuning existing networks? Which models are, there are best practices. Um, do we have some of those in our resources, Dan? you know, the rules of thumb that people have discovered about different kinds of activations. For example, people for a long time were using sigmoidal activations, but they can suffer, for example, from vanishing gradient. So then the best practice switch to value and, and things like that. You know, I actually don't think that we have, I'm not, I haven't even really heard of a collection of things like that yeah um, there are there's a bunch of neural network papers with collections. yeah no, no no i know that there are i just mean up like a website with like a list of like here are all the tips and tricks i think no, they're usually papers they're like yeah papers. So there's a bunch of papers for that i think one of the things that i really like to do is rely on uh there's a medium i guess it's not necessarily it's not one blog it's a bunch of people contribute to it called uh towards data science and it usually has really uh, well-written short articles, uh, off, you know, sometimes about papers or different architectures or stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of just like institutional personal knowledge uh, that unfortunately is just not easy to share for like, how many do you usually start with? Something that Alex once told me that I think is really helpful is if you wanna figure out a good set of default parameters, find a paper that has tried to do what you're doing look for their code. A sort of hidden fact about neural network literature is that a lot of the tricks are actually not in the paper, they're in the code. There's a lot of engineering that happens behind the scenes that are not necessarily parts of the proofs that are actually the reasons the network works. And so I would copy whatever it is that they did to try to reproduce their results and then try it on your data and use that as a starting point. If you notice that 
SCVI has a few different data sets and they try anywhere from three to four hidden layers with anywhere from 256 to, you know, 2048 nodes, like try those area, you know, those ranges, I think you can start to play within. Um, Shams is asking, how do you use these tools to find gene programs? Um, a little bit of a way, vague question. It depends on what you mean. Um, people have started to use graph neural networks, as I pointed to yesterday, to find more things about gene-gene relationships. Something like something that gives clusters, like Sasi, you could always find out what the genes that are active in the cluster. Uh, we talked about mutual information for finding relationships between genes. Just really depends on what you mean by program. Yes, the coding notebooks and links will remain indefinitely. Yeah, there's actually, if you notice, um, and you look at the links, there's actually a GitHub repository that um, those all come from. And that GitHub repository is public. Um, it's not a, it's not meant to be a public facing repository. So it's not really well documented and it's not necessarily meant for people to like, you know, push or pull, you know, create pull requests to, but rather just uh, an internal sort of like drop, a public Dropbox that we use for PowerPoints and stuff. Uh, so you should be able to use those for forever. Um, but I also recommend for CoLab, you know, you can always save copies of notebooks. Uh, and that just gets saved in your Google Drive. Um, Can neural networks be used for multi-omics integration? Yeah, that's exactly what I was explaining, Megan, because you can take data from one omics and have it generate the data from the other omics that you didn't measure, but maybe you have other data sets from that omics and integrate the omics. That's exactly what, what I was saying by saying data integration, domain transfer and all that. If there are other questions, um, please continue to submit them in the Slack. You can stay around the main session for a little bit. It is 1.30 now. And so um, today we actually have, I think, the fewest number of notebooks. I know things have been a little bit sort of out of whack throughout the course, just in not out of whack, just uneven in terms of the number of, of notebooks per day. Um, today, there are only two. Um, but the reason for that is that we're hoping that people take the time to go back and do some notebooks they might not have completed from previous days of the course, or that they use today as an opportunity to start to analyze some of their own single cell data sets. And so if you um, are interested in either of the, so first of all, everyone should do the, the notebooks that are there. Um, but if you have questions about anything that we've covered so far, any of the notebooks or any new things that have come up in your reading, today is you know, basically the last opportunity to ask all the TAs as many questions as you want. Um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms. Remember everyone to fill out that end of course survey. And some of you, you know, I uh, really appreciated everyone attending this workshop and um, we'll get to our lab component. All right, thanks everyone for participating. Bye.